So are there any like plant questions you want? No, no, <laughs> just ask whatever you want. Just ask us in public, just ask us privately off camera. This no, is no. me we're talking about. <laughs> this is um This is what we're reminding you. <laughs> nothing's at stake. I'm just here having fun with people. Exactly. Talking about things I like. You can't fail me on it. Well maybe you can and I don't know. <laughs> uh, maybe I shouldn't say that. Sounds like a challenge. So, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Daniel Ray, as it says here. So I've been invited. I'm very honored to be here at the first inaugural Papers We Love meeting. Uh, this is really cool, and um, for multiple reasons. So having been in academics for a while, and all my friends going off and getting jobs, I noticed there's a real strong disconnect between industry and academics. And I think having like a Papers We Love kind of chapter in a hacker space is a really good um, position because we can kind of you know people who work hard and are really smart, and people who sit in school hard and are really smart, can hopefully connect. Because um, a lot of knowledge in academics, a lot of knowledge in industry, and people, there's not a lot of crosstalk. So I hope maybe something can come of this. Um, so it's really cool to be here. And I'm here presenting my master's work, recently defended, uh, entitled Paintboard Prototyping Interactive Character Behaviors by Digitally Painting Storyboards. So I'm going to start out by talking about video games and interactive worlds. And my video won't start. Okay. Things always go the way you plan. I'm going to talk about video games. Yeah. So interactive worlds. Um, one way to make an interactive world uh, more immersive is to have them dy dynamically react to the actions of the player character. For example, here, the player character bumps into some people, and they drop their stuff and get angry, and the noise attracts this other person, and they're yelling and trying to get their attention. And these interactive behaviors, as we call them, um, are really tough to create. We found out we did some investigation, and it turns out they're really hard to design, so when you're kind of at the beginning stages of developing games, and you're not quite sure, and you're just throwing things against the wall, you have to program everything, and it takes a really long time. So we asked, could we kind of speed up this uh, design process for interactive behaviors? But to start with, we wanted to know that there really was a problem, right? We, we had this in our head. So we interviewed some people, some professional uh, designers and developers from the industry. So we did four interviews uh, with designers in AAA studios, indie studios, um, well, just four, but it gives us a wide variety of, of the problem space. And we did semi-structured interviews, which is just uh, we come prepared with a list of questions that we're primarily interested in. And if the participant talks about some experience that's really cool, we'll drill down as long as we want um, and investigate these things. And so we did this, and we analyze it. Um, we transcribe it and analyze it. With um, There's ways you can do this really scientifically. You can do it by a technique called open coding which if you don't know is you can go through um, these paragraphs and sentences and you can attach keywords or themes to them. Um, so for example, you know, we had themes like um, iteration or you know, programming <laughs> takes a lot of time. And you start tagging these ideas and as you go through, you, know, you start seeing emergent themes come up and you can actually do this with multiple people if you want to be super precise and see how much they agree. Um, really cool technique, qualitative methods. But we just did um, a quick uh, look through to see what we could find, just to get an idea of the problem space. And we found, surprise, surprise, iteration was really important. So people in software, uh, like all of us here, presumably, um, know that software is really iterative. But what we found out specifically was there's a lot of iteration specifically at the design phase, so early on. Not trying to iterate over you know, fixing bugs and getting a final project, but just figuring out what you want to make. Um, so you start out, you know, you have some ideas, you sketch things out, you create, and then you go to your code and you whack something out, and you try it, you compile, you test, you play around with it. And you say, well, that worked, and maybe you go back and edit it, or maybe it doesn't work at all, and you toss it out and try something new. We saw this a lot um, with a bunch of different ways to create behaviors. And it turns out, yeah, most of the time was spent programming, either tweaking things and simulate like parameters and simulations, or writing entire languages and compilers for them just to make their game development easier at this stage. So we said, OK, we should just enable rapid prototyping at this early stage. So we don't want to make a final, we don't, we don't need to make a final product, not something nice and precise. If we can, that would be great. But let's help out this early prototyping stage. So there's a set of techniques that are really good for early prototyping that have been seen in a lot of HCI research early. earlier. Um, Sketch-based techniques is one of them. So pictured here, really low res, um, it's from 99. A um, really cool technique called Teddy, and it, for instance, uh, this is one example, is just by doing a 2D sketch, it automatically creates a 3D model. Just from a quick sketch, you can see it, him using the, uh, sketching out an arm here for this teddy bear, and once he lifts the pen, it'll actually, you can go online and check videos, 
it will um, turn it into a 3D model that you can export or manipulate. Really cool. But what's the trade-off? Why isn't this you know, everywhere? Well, the trade-off is it's imprecise. So if you want something that's not you know, a goofy or comical looking teddy bear, like the style's already decided. So instead of having a professional who's really experienced with Maya and like a weeks at a time on a 3D model, you can sketch out a quick model in a minute or two. You don't have the control, but you can do it really quickly. So that kind of matches up what we want with prototyping. We just want to hash things out really quickly, and in the end, it doesn't matter if we leave out some of the detail. We can get that when we code out the final game in the end. So we're going to keep the sketch-based techniques in our mind. Another uh, common technique for prototyping is storyboarding. And this is used everywhere from film um, to software design, interface design, all over video editing. And it's great because you can prototype, like conceptualize things right away. You have an idea floating around in your head, but it's much different to get it down, right down on paper. So you have to sketch things out, like here, this you know, an idea for a piece of software, a person interacting with the real world and the smartphone. And if you don't like the idea, you can change one frame, you can erase, you can sketch in, or you can just start a whole new storyboard. It's really iterative, it's really quick, and you can hash out ideas really quickly. So we're like, great, this is kind of where we want to go. Let's keep this in mind. However, maybe people have already figured out cool ways to create interactive behaviors. Well, what's already out there? Well, it turns out not much. Um, there is this work. Maybe it's a bit hard to see. It's only black and white. That's all I could get. And they create interactive behaviors by a series of mouse gestures. So for example, if you want to make a behavior for this bird, somebody's throwing out breadcrumbs and want to teach a bird to come and eat the breadcrumbs. They do things like you click on the bird, you click on the bread, you draw an arrow with your mouse, and you do all these weird mouse gestures, and you link them together, and you'll get a behavior. So this is really great. It's really dependent. It's um, kind of cool, but it has this kind of logical structure. It's essentially visual programming. Because there's a syntax of which gestures you can input at what time, and you know, a state machine kind of model for input. If you look into literature on creativity, it actually shows that, well, logical structure is, is fine in the end, but when you're trying to explore a space, it's actually good to have something a lot more free form. So he said, OK, this might be better for producing a final behavior, but for exploring, we want to do something without this state machine style input. This led us to uh, work in the field of programming by demonstration. Now, if you haven't heard of this, it's really cool. Um, it's kind of a machine learning technique. We give a performance of what you want a computer to learn. For example, these two characters might be interacting. You can draw the path of one and then draw the path of another. And what happens is as you draw the second path, the first one moves along the path you drew. And then you pretend to do the interaction. And now you have a paired set of paths, and it tries to learn what you were trying to do there. So this is really close to what we wanted. And this is great because it's free form. There's no structure. You just show something. Really cool. There's two, uh, a couple of major issues here we wanted to improve upon uh, from this work. Uh, for instance, this was a style by demonstration. So instead of learning what they were doing, like the behavior itself, they wanted to learn how they were moving. So was it slow, kind of lethargic, or were they bouncing around really energetically? That was their focus. So we want to focus more on like an actual crea uh, creating an actual behavior. Secondly, um, there's no environment here. That's really good. It's like a clean pad of uh, a paper for sketching, but most of your games have complex environments and this factors heavily into the behaviors. And finally, there's no editing here. So iteration, of course, is always important. And an important part of iteration is being able to change or improve upon what you've already made. And for this uh, work, you, once you made a behavior, if you didn't like it, you just chucked it out and started again. For the person of this work, that was great because it was quick. Um, but editing is kind of important. So we have these ideas and this background information, but we were kind of thinking, where do we start? How do people even think about making interactive behaviors? Let's get some grounding for how we'll make a program that assists us. So we did this by seeing how programmers already make interactive behaviors. So we got a bunch of uh, fourth-year HCI students, presumably very good at programming, and we gave them a, a situation uh, with an API. They could you know, query parts in this uh, grid. They can move characters around, provide the next move. We told them, make any three behaviors you wanted. And we gave them a month. So no real heavy time limits. So you don't have to you know, quickly do an assignment in a week kind of thing. And we got their code and their final behaviors. And we did kind of open coding on their code. So instead of looking at sentences and paragraphs and tagging ideas, we were looking at blocks of code and algorithms. We said, hey, you know, how are people tackling this problem? We found some interesting things um, across all 78 implementations. So one of the things was that uh, people would use a, they would try to analyze the game state at any given time. And they do so with a variety of 
calculations, be it like what is the relative positions of the characters, or can they see each other? And it turns out this set of calculations is kind of similar across a lot of behaviors. By no means complete, um, but we, most of the 19 different types we saw could be kind of encompassed with a small set of these calculations. I'll get into how we use those later, but that was one cool common thing. The other was how they specified the problems. Programmers naturally did these calculations and specified areas. For example, if this character was supposed to be guarding the treasure, they might calculate that, hey, this is really far away from the treasure and you can't see the treasure, or you know, how they interpreted what a guard should be. So no, you, sh you shouldn't go in these kind of areas, these kind of grid cells. Conversely, they also would specify um, areas that they wanted to go into. So these are supposed to be gold. Um, but they might, for instance, one person thought that, hey, this can block off a common path, but you can still see the treasure, so maybe it's a good space uh, to go if you want to guard the treasure here. And so we took this idea of specifying places you want the character to go and places you don't want them to go, and we said, how can we fit this in with sketching? Because that was a cool initial technique. But instead of sketching, we thought about, how about painting? So instead of drawing paths, we can just paint in areas on on the game itself. So let's give that a shot. And why don't we give that a shot? I'll show you a live demo here. Hopefully things won't break. So this is paintboard. We have the sketching area here on the um, on the left. We have some tools that we can use, and the storyboard currently empty on the right. First, I'm going to start out by clicking on these bricks. Oops. I'm just going to sketch out a quick prototype environment. This isn't anything special. Maybe we just have a simple environment. These bricks represent areas that can't be walked through or seen through. Uh, be those whatever you want. And then we have uh, a representation of the non-player character here, the NPC. We want to create a behavior for this guy. We have Black Mage here, who wants to be, uh, who's going to be the player character, uh, the person I'll end up controlling on my computer. And then we need a behavior to create. So, Right off the bat, I'm thinking, hey, I like that video I saw earlier. We had this character that was like waving, getting the main character's attention. Maybe I, w I want to try that out um, to start off my game, you know, give them some information. So I'm going to click on this gold paint. I'm going to say, well, what's the goal of trying to get somebody's attention, other than the waving and screaming, because we're just talking about motion paths here. Let's say you want to get kind of close in and towards the front, uh, so you can, you know, yell and get their attention. And then I'm going to click on the red paint. It's the same thing I kind of mentioned before. Where do you not want to go? Where do you want to avoid when you're trying to get someone's attention? I'd say kind of the opposite. You want behind, to the side, maybe out of sight. Um, these kind of areas, you, they can just ignore you or walk away. It's just a quick sketch. And of course, you don't want to go too far away. But for now, let's just start with this. Now, the storyboarding comes into play. So this is just one instance of maybe how someone would get someone's attention. So I'm going to click the new screenshot button. We're going to add a new frame to the storyboard. Pops up to the side. I can always go back if I want uh, to see, add new paint, etc. What happens is the behavior progresses. So perhaps I try to, our NPC decides, tries to get their attention, but the player, in the meantime, just walks away. So what should this look like now? Well, I would say to us it would look very sim uh, similar uh, conceptually, but the situation's all different. So I still want to get kind of in front of and close by. But again, I don't want to be behind, maybe too far back, or to the side here, out of sight. So it's still fairly similar. Now I could go on ad nauseum here. Um, but let's, you know, we want a prototype. We want things to be quick. Let's just see what kind of behavior this might make. So I'm going to hit the play button here. And what Paintboard will do, will compile that storyboard into an actual behavior. I'll take control of the player character with my keyboard. And the NPC will start moving according to the behavior Paintboard thinks I want it to make. Let's see how that works. So hit play. I'm just going to start moving. He runs in, into here, into the corridor with me, and I try to get around. And, whoop, got by him. He's following me. Maybe I, oh, I can't get by. I want to run away. I'm just going to try to run away from this guy, and he, he stops. Well, that's weird. What, ha what happened? Hmm, is it a live demo, bud? Hmm. Or maybe I set you guys up. So I'm going to stop here. And what happens is Paintboard is trying to predict what this painting would look like, given the situation. This isn't a huge stretch right now. You see it's very similar to my second um, storyboard frame, just a little farther over to the right. So maybe it doesn't seem so impressive. It looks pretty similar, though, so I'm pretty happy with this result. But I realize it's kind of a conceptual issue here. 
the NPC is not moving because he wants to get to the goals, but I say you're not allowed to cross through any of these squares. I made a, I goofed here. I made a mistake. And he's not going to walk all the way around the world just to fulfill a goal. He's too lazy for that. So I kind of made a mistake here, and I realized the issue is not how it, it's okay if he goes through these areas as long as he ends up in the goal. So I'm going to correct these. I'm going to go back and edit my previous storyboard frames and just take out the spread. It actually turns out to be a very simple behavior. All right. If I hit play, he still bothers me. If I run through these tighter areas, he still follows me all the way through. And he's just like yelling and grabbing at me. So that's kind of how, the, how that worked out. But you might argue that was really simple. That wasn't terribly interesting at all. And I, I would agree. Let's try something a little more difficult. So I'm going to delete this storyboard. I'm going to quickly change up the environment. In the meantime, I'd like to point out um, one fact. The cool part about Paintboard is that you can actually interact with the behavior. I would say that's a key point because you might ask, you know, couldn't I just have handed somebody an actual storyboard that I created with pen and paper? And sure, but I, if I had added kind of a storyboard with that, please don't go into these kind of areas, perhaps the programmer would have realized that that was a mistake while programming, but he still would have had to expend effort and maybe even code coding time to figure that out. So interacting is actually really useful to figuring out you know, how your storyboard really works out, if it's actually how you imagined it. So here we have a new situation. Maybe I didn't like that getting their attention, but instead I want to have a little more action at the start. I'll have the NPC sneak up to the player. Sneaking sounds a little harder. Such that, look. So now I'm going to start with the goal. Pretty simple. What's the goal of sneaking up to someone? Well, I would say you just want to get close to and behind so you can steal their gold or stab them or whatever you do in these video games. And again, um, what's the avoid state? So I'm going to click um, the red paint and say, where shouldn't you go to sneak? And I would say, well, anywhere the character can see isn't a good idea. Because if you're seen while sneaking, well, you're not doing a very good job of it. So something rough like that. All right, well, that's a start. What happens is, again as the behavior goes on? So let's add a scene to our storyboard. So perhaps the character starts walking to the side. Oops, too far. And the NPC rushes in and goes, OK, this is my chance. Well, the situation now is not all that um, complex, perhaps. Something similar, maybe the goal's a bit bigger. I'm just sketching roughly, sketch it in quickly. And of course, don't go where the player can see. But maybe just the last moment, the player has an inkling and spins around and says, ooh, am I being followed? Well, again, the goal isn't too crazy. And again, the avoid state looks similar. But perhaps the path we were about to take there, just uh, through this area here, well, it's no longer a good place to go because I'm looking there and I don't want him to move there. So I'll just sketch in the red here, something like this. I'd say let's, this is good enough. Let's, let's try out and see what happens. So I'm going to hit the play button again. We're going to start interacting. So they turn around. Oh, he sneaked up. That wasn't too exciting. I'm not really moving. Let's start moving. And again, well, he's moving here, but sometimes he's not moving again. This, this isn't really sneaking. Let's activate kind of a debug mode. So here again, Paintboard is predicting the painting that I might have drawn, but it's doing it in real time. I can continue interacting. You can see him trying to sneak up, staying in those goal spaces. I can see, well, the red area is pretty good. But sometimes the goal area is huge and kind of really, really wrong. I go, no, that's not quite what I wanted. So at this point, I can quickly stop. I can click on this eraser button. I can be like, no, pay it for it. That's not what I wanted at all. So I can kind of pare it down. And right where I was, I can hit play again. I can see that paintboard learned its mistake. And it's, pretty, it's a little rough around the edges, but it's still really good. So let's turn off the colors and interact a bit more, because I find them a bit distracting. So maybe I'm running, he's trying to catch up. I turn around, he's waiting for his chance. I go, hmm, maybe we're not being followed. Yeah, it seems pretty good. Maybe I turn around here. Oh, try to trick him, but he heads around the other way. So, pretty good. Um, so that's a sneak. And I've prepared one more just to save some time. Oh, that's not the folder I'm supposed to be in. This looks about right. 
All right, so I made a guard behavior here just to present. So an additional element here is this treasure chest. This represents a point of interest, not necessarily treasure, but often we found in our interviews with the industry people that um, a common thing in behavior is there's an, um, an item or an area, a static piece in the environment that behaviors revolve around, be it a trap or a treasure or some goal of some sort or another <laughs> person. And so we have this representing those areas. So I'll run you through the story very quickly. The, the red area, of course, is don't move too far away from the the treasure that you're guarding. We have our guard here. And in the meantime, just stay close, patrol around. But if the player comes close, you want to be there. You want to block off his path, even in a, if he tries to squeeze around the other side. And if he runs away again, then you can just go back to patrolling. And there's a couple more that are very similar to these. And let's start playing. So my player kind of approaches, and the guard gets wary. And he's kind of blocking me off. And I try to go around the side, and that's that's fine. So maybe I try to be clever, pretend to leave. He's not really going to wander far away. And as soon as I appear, there he is. Like kind of close. I'm kind of close by, but it's a prototype. It's rough on the edges. Maybe my guy says I don't want him to see me, so I, I leave. What happens to the guard? Maybe my guy's pretending, and the guard will just wander around. And then I say, that's my chance. I'm going to come in, and there he is. So this is how a guard might feel uh, if I created it in this way. That's a prototype of three different behaviors. Hope that was enjoyable. Um, but we didn't just make a super cool tool. In research, you often have to you know, have a reason for doing these things, unfortunately. Um, but we had some goals. So just to remind you quickly, we wanted to rapidly prototype interactive behaviors. And we enabled that by the storyboarding and painting. Uh, one of our goals is to have this real-time interaction. So above normal paper storyboarding, we can actually test the behavior. We had that color feedback uh, so we could always see what the paintboard was doing. We could edit at any point, and there was no structure. Like, I could have created any of those frames in any order. The result would have been the same. So how does it work? So earlier I said there was a set of calculations that we found that people used in a, commonly across a bunch of behaviors. And they used these to analyze the game space. Now, I'm not pressing that these state features, as we call them, will cover every behavior ever imaginable. Um, I know for a fact they don't. Um, but as a proof of concept, we did some experimentation and picked uh, a few of them. These are, for example, if we're analyzing the space, and in particular this grid cell, we, this grid cell has a position. That's that's a pretty basic piece of information. It has an xy coordinate. It also has a position relative to user orientation. So this grid cell is also in front of and to the right of the player character here. That's important to capture these uh, ideas of in, in front and behind, like I showed <coughs> earlier. We also have a position relative to the, users, um, to the user and the point of interest. So often when we have these points of interest in the environment, we found that you know, the behavior revolved around them. So we captured everything's relation by creating a simple coordinate space based on the player's location oriented towards the point of interest. And we could measure things uh, position in relation to this. We also have visibility. So can the player character, you can't really see their arrows casting out to multiple squares around here. And, um, is the, can the user character uh, see that square? Can the NPC character see that square? And finally, distance. So how far are things away from each other uh, based on Euclidean distance? So that's how we analyze the space. But how do we generate this behavior? Well, you saw we have an input storyboard. That's the input to our algorithm. And the output is a behavior. But what does that mean? So given a state that we've never seen before, a situation, we have to predict the next move or create the next move of the character. As I kind of hinted at in the earlier demos, we do that by having the paintboard predict um, how the author would have painted this situation based on the storyboard. We do that by first, when we, hit it, when we hit play in the algorithm, we compile the storyboard. We do that by going through every single grid cell in the entire storyboard, across all frames. And we analyze, for instance, this grid cell, their state features. So this has relative position, has visibility, distance, etc., from the user character. And there's a bunch more, as I talked about earlier. It also has a label. In this case, the author decided this was a type of square that should be avoided. And in other words, um, another word for label is class. And you might be seeing where I'm getting with this. If we have a group of descriptive vectors, uh, luckily numeric, that makes things easier. We also have classes, red, gold, and in this case, of course, in this case, unpainted. That's important as well. We can throw these into uh, statistical machine learning algorithms. And it does most of the heavy lifting for us. So we get a trained classifier after throwing all the grid cells and all the labels into the training program. And we have this classifier, and now we're in this new situation. And we simply do the same thing. We go through every single grid cell, 
for this, this one, and we calculate state features, we say, hey, train classifier, what would a cell with these kind of features uh, be painted, do you think, based on that storyboard? We might say red. We do this for all of them, and these features change slowly, and you know, this one might be gold, and because we're making a sneak behavior in this example, and we do this for every square. Um, eventually, we have the entire painting, and then we simply move according to the paint. This is really naive. We didn't try to pull any crazy tricks. We just simply took the MPC, did a breadth first search, found the nearest gold space, and we said, move to it. But don't go through the red squares. Instead, traverse as many unpainted squares as possible. Now, in this case, earlier you might have said, well, the MPC didn't move at all. This is because we use simple distance thresholding. So again, the MPC wouldn't walk all the way around the Earth just to find the one path possible. So we, we gave it a distance uh, threshold. But in general, this is how it works. So that's paintboard. But we also have to kind of see, you know, we thought this was cool. We followed some, some guidelines. We want to kind of evaluate, are we on the right track? Where, where are we going with this? So we did a proof of concept workshop. And by proof of concept, I mean we're trying to prove our own concepts here, not that the workshop itself was proof of concept. And we did this with uh, five hobbyists and professional game developers. We actually did it here in a skull space, so that was really cool. Thanks again for helping out. And I had them in, and I gave them a 15 minute tutorial on paintboard. Uh, they each had their own laptop with paintboard installed. And uh, I gave them an hour, and I just said, go crazy. Make whatever you want with paintboard. Tell me what works, what doesn't, what you like, what you don't. I also, at the end of the experience, provided a questionnaire, very short, um, just targeting specific aspects I was interested in about usability and what they thought about painting. So what did we find out? So we analyzed these responses and the discussions that uh, ensued, because it was very friendly. Everyone was yakking and complaining and finding bugs. Um, and we analyzed all this data, and we found out a couple themes. One of them was prototyping. Maybe this should seem obvious, but we had quotes, a lot of them, such as, I would use this as a prototyping tool to make quick behaviors that I would then implement with code. This is just representative of others of its kind. This is exactly what we intended with Paintboard. It's rough around the edges. We actually have people complaining that it's not really ready. It often has weird behavior, but it's good for prototyping. It's, I would never make a final product with it, but it's really good to try things out. And then I'd go back to coding, like you see here. Another thing that came up that was a bit surprising was using Paintboard as a communication tool. So you might have um, designers and developers, or just developers together. Uh, especially in AAA studios, you have this designer-developer split. And our users suggested that in this case, it might be easier to, to use Paintboard to visually show other simple behaviors that can then be expanded to more complex situations. So a lot of the discussion that came up was, you know, they have designers, they don't know how to code, or they're artists, or they have a different background. And with Paintboard, they might be able to actually contribute to ideas and provide working examples of you know, partial games with tools such as Paintboard. This could help facilitate um, uh, communication and discussion with developers and designers working on the same paint, painting. Um, also in our questionnaires, we targeted exactly like, what do you think about painting behaviors? You know, when I came up with this idea, I thought it was really crazy, and maybe these developers are like, this, this isn't going to work. So we had uh, quotes such as, I think abstraction, the abstraction of the concepts would be very easy to understand, as well as the ability to alter states during play and the ability to watch the goal and avoid state change. That's a bit of a mouthful, but I chose this one because I showed you those research goals earlier. We had these design goals, and this kind of encompasses a lot of them. You know, we try to keep a simple interface. Um, we can alter the states. We can watch the states change during play. We have the constant interaction, that feedback, and this, they all responded really well to this. Even though they're professional, they're also professional software developers. Um, at least half of them were professional game developers, but they kind of warmed up to this concept. And if you think they were just saying nice things, we also had them save uh, their storyboards that they made. And one of the results we saw is, at first, admittedly, some of them had a bit of struggle uh, you know, understanding how the painting worked out. But by the end, we saw great storyboards. So these are three, um, three frames from a nine-frame storyboard, actually from the workshop. And I'll just run through them quickly. So the first one, the NPC here, he has a goal, stay by the door when the player's looking out. So seems pretty similar to earlier, stay hidden. But if the player looks away, he should run somewhere in this hallway, but stay there for a second. And if the player gives him a chance, run towards the treasure. And this continued on for the other six frames about what happens if he gets caught and where she should run, and what happens you know, if he gets stuck in a corner. And it's very elaborate. And I thought it was really easy to understand. So this is just, you know, it's a sanity check. It shows that we're on the right track. People within an hour who are professional coders can use this tool, even though it's a bit crazy. But um, even though we have great storyboards such as this, we often have complaints that, hey, what's paintboard doing here? My MPC is not moving right, or it's not moving at all. 
Even good storyboards like this sometimes fail to generate a good behavior. This was a flaw in our algorithm. So we thought, we need to investigate this a little more. Why are sometimes you know, goals not being generated? Well, how can we evaluate the performance and where to improve paintboard? So we decided to do an algorithmic evaluation. Now, usually in research, when we evaluate algorithms, we compare them to something similar. But we thought paintboard was pretty unique. Compared to the things we showed earlier, it wouldn't be a fair comparison because those other works had different goals. Uh, things they were trying to prove. So we said, okay, well, we need to get an idea. We need to change something to get an idea of what paper can improve. So for a start, let's do something simple. We use machine learning. Um, in our case, we use an SVM, a support vector machine. And um, there's lots of different approaches to machine learning. So let's try a bunch of different approaches. So we got uh, nine participants in. Uh, we gave them three behaviors to create that we selected. And we had them make 10 storyboards for each behavior. And a storyboard being complete in and of itself. So if they're using paintboard on their own, each of those 10 storyboards need to fully train a uh, paintboard. So now we have a bunch of storyboards. We need to answer a very hard question. So our, our users are gone. We have our data. We have to ask, well, what is a good behavior? What does it mean for paintboard to be correct? Um, and this was pretty tough. So we started out with a classic, well, we'll evaluate with classic training and test setup. We decided to train with just one storyboard per, uh, per author, per behavior. And then we had nine other storyboards from that author for that behavior. We decided some authors might, we had evidence that these <coughs> authors interpreted different, for example, what does it mean to sneak up to somebody? That's different from author to author, but within each author we had 10 storyboards for one behavior. So we had nine extra after we trained. So we trained paintboard and we got this classifier, this machine learning classifier for various different algorithms. We had these nine other storyboards. What we did is we stripped those storyboards of paint we said, now we just have situations. We don't have any paint, but the player and the character and the environment are there. So we took this train classifier, for instance, um, could be a sneak by this one author, and we used it to um, paint every other square in every other storyboard. And now we had a generated painting, and we had a author painted painting, and we just said, well, the author's intent is probably what they painted. That's our assumption. Um, so we just compared them square by square. So for example, in this one, uh, maybe we looked at this square. Um, here, the author left it unpainted. Maybe our generated painting was also unpainted. That's a match, 100% for that square. And if it was red or gold, we said mismatch. So it's a pretty strict definition. And we did this uh, allowing each storyboard to be used as training once, and we rotated through the sets. So that's a uh, cross-validation, classic machine learning technique. We had some results. Well, we did this for five different machine learning algorithms. We used two different SVMs. From the top, we had a polynomial kernel SVM and a radial basis function kernel SVM. If you're curious, the second one is the one we used in the demo and um, the, all the studies. We also tried out random force as a representative, re representative of decision tree-based learning. We had naive Bayes, um, as it's often performs really well, uh, even though it's really simple and provides a good baseline. We also had K-nearest neighbors as a clustering-based technique. And we set up all the parameters, we ran them, and we have these results. And we did some statistical analysis. And what we found out was that the support vector machine with the radial basis function, the one we used, was uh, provably better than the polynomial and the naive phase, but nothing else. So random floors, k nearest neighbors, well, they look a bit worse, but statistically, they could be the same. We don't know. Could have been random checks. So what can we learn from this? Well, we often say there's no free lunch in machine learning, but here we have a, a small free lunch. That's, that's nice, you know, we can, some algorithms might be better, but we have to think about what this means going forward. So if we really want to improve paintboard, even to making final behaviors uh, that we could use in production even, we're going to need to blow way past the 80% mark. Maybe machine learning isn't the way to go. Maybe uh, out of the box machine learning anyways. Uh, maybe we need to make a custom kernel for an SVM that works with uh, storyboard data. I'm not a machine learning person. I'm not, that, I'm not that good at math. I'll leave that to other researchers. But that could be one approach. We could also just ditch machine learning and try maybe a statist uh, an analytical approach, something not based on statistics. That might work. Again, that sounds really hard. Anybody's welcome to tackle it, but it's just future direction. So we don't really know where to go. But the other way to interpret this results, or another thing to keep in mind when interpreting these results is, this looks pretty low. We had our top at about 70, 75, 78%. But I also want to keep in mind that we had a really strict definition of accuracy, and you can criticize, we're trying to prototype. So if we had a red cell, and that was turned out to be unpainted, we penalize that. However, um, what if there's a red cell right beside it? Well, we're just prototyping. Maybe, maybe we should have been a little more forgiving. So just keep that in mind. We get a really strict definition of accuracy here. So that's uh, some ways we can go. 
But there's a lot of other things that are probably on your mind. You might want to ask questions about, feel free. But one of the things we want to do is, well, we have this small grid. We have a small environment. What if we integrate it into a tool like Unity? We have huge environments, more complex um, environments. What are the challenges for research here? What's the challenges for Paintboard? Well, it's no longer grid-based. It's no longer It's no longer discrete. Uh, we can kind of simulate this if we want by throwing over, you know, simulated grids. Um, but how how will this work in Unity? Maybe there'll be some cool research challenges in there. Another big thing, as I'm assuming uh, there's a lot of gamers in the room, is most games have a lot of NPCs. We had one-on-one -on -one interaction, just as a base case to simplify the problem. But what if we had a bunch of them? This could have problems in the algorithm, so we want things to keep uh, fast enough with Paintboard um, to keep that interaction. So if I wanted to test out my behavior, but it took like a second to process all the data, that wouldn't be where we want, that's not usable. So we need to keep that in mind. But there's also uh, interface challenges. So for Paintboard, we introduced this idea of painting storyboards. Um, but that worked well for one character, but what if we had seven? You know, would the paints overlap? Would that be too chaotic to look at? Should we have one specific storyboard per NPC? But then we're not seeing all the interactions at once. Maybe that's really confusing. So there's a, uh, both HCI and algorithmic uh, problems to be solved there. We also have this walking idea. Uh, there's other types of games, not just um, movements such as driving. There's also fighting games. Can you paint a fighting game? Does that make sense? Well, I would say painting a behavior at the beginning didn't make any sense, so you know, I can be convinced that it might work out. Um, what about 3D movement? If you're trying to make um, an AI to simulate a plane moving in like a training simulation, how do you paint in 3D? What if there's no objects to catch your paint upon? These are really tough problems. We have to think about this. And finally, I don't think paintboard should be just be constrained to the virtual realm. Uh, with some cool computer vision and a little bit of work, I think we could move this over to robotics and have maybe even people at home you know, control their own robots by painting around in their environment. So in summary, video games are cool, but they're really hard to make. And one of the ways we want to make them better is uh, having interactive behaviors. And these are really tough to create at the start in the early prototyping phase because of the high cost of pro uh, programming. I presented Paintboard, our, an a program that enables users to rapidly prototype interactive behaviors by digitally painting storyboards I presented also the results of a proof of concept workshop showing that we're on the right track towards our research goals. Not that paper is the best tool ever, but these are things we should consider and we're moving in the right direction, a right direction. We also provided some insight into the algorithm, so there's still a lot of question marks on you know, things that worked and things that didn't. I'd be happy to take questions on it. Um, but we had some directions for moving forward there. Um, if you have to take questions now, I'd like to thank, of course, uh, U of M and the University of Tokyo, where most of this research took place, and my funding agencies, because I have to thank them. And uh, there's other papers that's basically the condensed version of my thesis. So if you didn't get through it all, because it seemed really long, there's shorter versions. They're a little more terse, but feel free. So let's not thank you very much. I'll have to take your questions now. We're we doing the standard clap, then questions? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So again, questions on methodology, even just about the program itself. Could you describe what a support vector machine is for those of us who have no idea what's about? Yeah, it? so okay. That's yeah. That's good. Okay, so sorry, I made some assumptions. So support vector machine is a yeah, good point. It's a machine learning based technique. So what it does is it takes a bunch of data, you need to give it like a vector. Um, usually it, well, typically numeric or you can do tricks to turn like text data into numbers. And you give all these vectors in uh, with, with a label. So like you said, I had all these, I had all these um, descript descriptive quantities like position and visibility, and this all in one vector. And then I had a color, a label. Um, and you give that like red. You give that to the, uh, the support vector machine and it does a bunch of really, really complicated math that I can't understand. And what it comes out with is it tries to generalize the relationships between the data in that vector and the, the class. So if maybe, like in my examples, it turns out that for the sneak, anywhere that the person could see really well um, was red. That was what I was thinking as I designed it, but the support vector machine kind of figures that out on its own, uh, given enough data. So that's, hopefully that makes sense. If you don't know, please. Um, so when you said the really complicated math part, is that the RBF or the polynomial? Both. Okay. So there's, um, the, the kernel thing, that was also kind of confusing. So a support vector machine is, is kind of the general class. And within 
the fancy math, there's, there's these things called kernel tricks that are really even fancier that I, I really, that's even be way beyond me. Um, but people have designed different types of kernels that work better with different types of data. So for instance, if you expect a, like your data to have a linear relationship, so a one-to-one -one kind of, or, you know, I guess, I don't know how to describe a linear relationship uh, from your numeric data to your class, um, then a linear kernel will typically be faster and perform better. But radial basis functions, for instance, helps um, learn things that aren't necessarily linear. So you might have, you know, if you can envision what you want as a function, which doesn't make sense because I showed you like a storyboard, but it can learn things that are parabolic or, you know, x cubed or fancy functions relationships. Um, translating functions to storyboards I know is a little complicated, um, but if you want more information, maybe we can uh, hash it out after. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Is this available? Yeah, so I was, uh, <laughs> uh, before this I realized my website's really out of date. Um, so the source code, I need to link to my website. My website is also out of date. I have it on a public repo, so I'll get that up later, but my personal website, actually it's right here, djray.ca, and if you just click on paintboard, um, there's videos that are out of date, there's publications that are out of date, Get, um, all these things I'll update, but the jar I updated just before um, this presentation. So this jar, if you want to download it and unzip it and all those things you can do with jars, um, I don't think, I think I included the source files in the jar, but I'll, I'll give a repo link after. Um, it's all there. Go for it. Have fun. The code's really ugly. I'm the one who did it by myself, but I tried to, you know, comment and make it nice, but feel free to tear it apart or even contact me if you have questions about it. Sure. Um, so the first thing that popped into my mind when I saw this was image processing stuff. Did you consider anything in that domain when considering uh, ways to interpret the data? Like, not to interpret the data, but like generate machine learning algorithms, like uh, okay. generating points on your support vector. Yeah, I think that's a really cool direction. So we're kind of working on a point by point basis here, right? Like we're learning mm -hmm. this grid cell and that grid cell and that grid cell. But, um, one of the cool things to do, and we did think about this, is what if you could figure out shapes of the paint? Yeah. Because um, one of the things that confused Paintboard, we figured out in the end, where it wouldn't generate any goals, is what if, if we had multiple different goals? So maybe, um, where is that? Maybe slide five, I'm just guessing. We're almost there. <coughs> yeah, so something like this. So if we had two goals or more, Paintboard would often have a lot of trouble learning that there should be multiple goals or they shouldn't all be melded into one huge mess. This is just a problem with the machine learning. I didn't have much control over that. But if you had uh, some digital image processing, computer vision stuff, maybe you could look at this, extract you know, red, gold, and maybe learn positions. Because for us, we had this nice fixed environment. And we could kind of learn from positions and shapes of colors. I think it would be really cool. I think you might run into problems, um, especially if you wanted to generalize behaviors to other parts of the environment. So something I didn't show you that's really cool is because we do it on a grid cell by grid cell basis, I can, in between, uh, while making behavior, I can change the environment and paintboard will just keep working because it analyzes on a grid cell. But if I change the environment, well, I think the your image processing would have to be a lot smarter on processing what the environment looks like and stuff. But I think it would really help solve these tougher problems of you know complex multi-goal relationships. So it's a good idea. Yeah, like, well, I'm just imagining like looking at its relationship to the environment would be like a feature of it, and you can represent things as being like a polygon of the feature point. You know? I think that'd be really cool. Um, it would also reduce uh, a lot of problems. So you'd have like nice big chunks. This is a goal, and that's you know one data point. It's a little easier to deal with. Um, for instance, one issue we, we dealt with is we had all we, we dealt with it point by point, but we're using statistical measures, and we have a lot of unpainted cells typically, mm -hmm. and so that would often overwhelm all our results, which is another reason why goal areas didn't show up is because we'd have like three or four goal areas and like a million unpainted cells. And if you look at this, well, if you're trying to learn that these types of cells, right, are, should be gold, well, these types of cells are unpainted and they're very similar to the ones inside. So if you didn't have enough of them, they'd typically disappear. So I think, yeah, I think that's a really good idea. Like going on the color base, it would be, to me anyways, really tricky. Um, but if you have any ideas, let me know. That would be really cool. You have a question? Yeah, so I, this is perhaps something I should just Google, but... No, 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 please. For, uh, <laughs> what is Naive Bayes, and why did it perform so poorly? Well, not ah. so poorly, but less, less well. So, I... I don't know what I'm just making some 
guesses who we do. So we had a bunch of algorithms, and so I guess I should have thought about this. In my thesis presentation, I get to assume that everyone's read my thesis. Um, but it's a long document, it was unfair to expect that. I also don't think I detailed it very well in my thesis. So we have, so I described um, SVMs. So Naive Bayes uh, uses Bayesian statistics. It's another complete branch of statistics based on other types of a smart math. Naive Bayes um, uses Bayes theory, which you may or may not have heard of. It's one formula, it can do a lot of neat things. Um, but it makes, the, the trick about Naive Bayes and what makes it fast is it makes a, an assumption that each data point it sees is independent um, from every other data point. So for instance, for instance, you might be learning about coin flips. You know, each one is independent from each other. You can maybe, well, you probably wouldn't learn anything because it's random, but that's the idea. That assumption usually doesn't hold in almost every case in the real world. For instance, in my grid cells, they're clearly not dependent, because I would say if there's a red cell, it's very likely that the ones next to it will also be a red cell. So they're kind of dependent on each other. Um, that's why it performed poorly. Normally, naive Bayes performs well in spite of that assumption being broken. So it's not surprising that it didn't, but it's often cited as, hey, it does pretty well considering how simple and fast it is. It's really quick to implement, too. If you just, you know, if you look it up, you can give it a shot. It's kind of cool. Very cool. Yeah. Um, any other questions? I don't know all of these all that well. But like, no neural networks? No neural networks because the library I found didn't support it. That's my <laughs> two honest <laughs> answers. Um, I found another Java library that supported it, but it, it took a lot of hacking to get my data formats in the right one. and. I wanted to graduate. That's the two honest <laughs> answers. No, that's um, totally fair. <laughs> but talking to people, um, especially if you, if you, I went and actually I talked to some machine learning profs at the U of M, um, for instance, Jackie Boltis, and he says, you know, he likes neural networks, but he's like, you did SVMs, or a lot of machine learning algorithms perform very similar. He says, especially neural networks and SVMs, in the end, their performances, if you get enough data, tend to even out. And he's like, if it's not there, I was basically asking, you know, is this a huge gaping flaw? Because I'm not as familiar with the field. And he said, you know, no, you have a pretty good variety here. And he said, it's, it's probably fine just to test things out. So um, if you want to know about random forests, I guess it's the last two random forests, Canaris neighbors. Actually, Canaris neighbors is easier. Maybe we'll start with that. Um, so basically, if you plot all your points out in a field, um, oh, man, this has been a while. If you plot all your points out in the field, what you try to find out is, so we have all the data from the storyboards in a graph. And it's a very multi-dimensional graph because we have all those state features. Those are our coordinates. And the point itself will be colored, you know, red, green, or red, gold, and unpainted. So I have this new point I want to classify, right? I'm painting this unpainted cell um, while I'm interacting. And I plop it in that graph somewhere. And what I do is I, k is the number of neighbors I check. So if I say five nearest neighbors, five nn, then I'll look at the five spatially closest neighbors to that point, and I'll see what their classes are. If they're all red, then I go, well, this is probably a red. And if it's, you know, if it's three out of five, then, well, it's probably a red, but I, you know, it's a bit sketchy, and that's roughly how that works. Uh, pretty simple. And the last one is random forest is a modern decision tree based learning. So what decision tree tries to do is it tries to break down the decision based on some rules it figures out. So it tries to make a tree branching structure. So you start at the top, and it tries to figure out a rule for that node, and it says, you know, if you pass this rule, go right. If you pass that rule, go left, and you go down the tree, and eventually at the bottom it'll say red or gold. Um, random forests say, hey, we should do this with a lot of trees, and then take a consensus from all of them, hence the forest, so there's trees everywhere. And um, you can get a really big forest, it tends to not overfit, so um, one machine learning thing is if you give it a lot of data, you know, it'll tend to fit your data really, really well, but not work outside of that data really well. It won't predict well in new situations. Random forest um, or a modern technique that tends to avoid that, even if you give like lots of data and lots of trees. So, and you can see it performed very well. So, that's uh, that's how that goes. They're also human item like readable. Oh yeah, so you can print them out. Uh, like the rules, it might be visibility less than 0.5 go left, and then you can see that, oh, everything on that side of the tree ends up gold. You can make these, like, learn humans to read it in the end. It's pretty neat. Unlike FEM outputs are just, like, decimal vectors forever that have no real meaning. Well, they have meaning, but it's, you can't really understand what they mean, so. How many dimensions did you, were you using in these? So I had, 
go back, uh, guessing slide. There we go. So all my dimensions were these. So we had the position, uh, two for x, y. The relative position by orientation is another two. So we got four. Trying to count. We had the users. Okay. Trying to remember that. So we had the user's position. Um, so I'm trying to go to the mission just to back up. Okay. So we had four there. We had this other uh, coordinate space for points of interest. If it was there, otherwise we wouldn't use those features. So that's um, two for the CPU, two for the user, two for the space we're looking at. Visibility of the space based on the, the player and the user. And, and distance of the computer and the user character from and the points of interest from these slots, from these spots. So you're looking roughly 15 to 20. Okay. Um, I can't remember the exact number. I saw yeah, the counting yeah. part with you. Just 15 to 20 ish. Yeah. Okay. Did you spend any time singling out variables, like adding, removing them, and seeing? No. Awesome question. So we're like, yeah. So what a, what about we have all these features? Are they even useful? We we did that really. We actually culled these from a set. What if we had extras? What if we had less? Um, we did a science study that didn't really go anywhere, so we didn't uh, talk about it too much. What we did was a very basic, greedy selection of features. We wanted to know, you know, what features predict um, these the best. Maybe other ones are confusing our algorithm and removing these gold spaces. So we took one feature in our S uh, we chose SVM, the best performing one, and we just said, okay, that performed the best. Let's use that. We said, given one feature, so position of the space. You know, try to learn based only on that information, how well does it perform? And we did that for every feature, and whatever was the best, we took that next step. And we just very greedily, we got a series of three features. I can't remember them offhand. I can look them up there in the thesis if you skim uh, to the algorithm section. If not, uh, just ping me uh, later on, um, on an email or something. I can find them out. But what was interesting is, so we, those three features ended up not being particularly better or worse than the the full set. Um, but the other problem is we had very little data to test it on. So we had the three behaviors uh, that we used in our algorithmic evaluations. We had an escape, a sneak, and a guard. And so it could have been that those three features just happened to perform really well on those um, behaviors. But if we took any of the other 19 we found and had people make storyboards, maybe it wouldn't generalize and different features would come out. So we couldn't really conclude anything too strong on which features are best. Um, but I think dynamic features adding, or even having um, user selectable features, like maybe you're drawing and you know what's important, and you want to just bypass some of the guesswork. Be like, yeah, I'm looking at visibility for sneak, and I'm looking at position. And that would be really interesting. It would complicate the interface. And there's this fine balance of we want to stay simple and fast versus control, or else we'll just end up programming again, which is great for making a final product. Have you thought much about how you're going to export this as generated code when you decide to make it so that it can produce a final product? Oh, um, so you mean the behaviors themselves or just paintboard? Behaviors themselves. Um, so that's another trick. So each of these, uh, especially with, well, basically every machine learning technique that I can think of off the top of my head, you can export the results of training into some kind of text file. So if you, it sounds a little hacky, but you could have it, you know, you'd have to probably protect it if you didn't want people messing with your AI. Uh, but you can export the files, like this is the guard AI, and this is the sneak AI, and you can export these files. And so when you have these characters in the game, you can just kind of boot these up and uh, load, load these trained, maybe professionally trained with larger data sets than just this. Um, you can boot them up and have them figure it out in game. Um, during play, but um, I think that's really cool, but I honestly don't think this approach will ever be product level. I think it's really, if I had to, like I don't want to say hedge, hedge my bets, I don't want to bad, uh, say bad things about my research, but the goal from the beginning was we want to make something good for prototyping. And I think with the choices we made, especially with this machine learning technique, I don't think we'll get 100% accuracy. Um, in any machine learning task, but you can get pretty close. I mean, people like Facebook are getting 99 point something percent for face detection. Like, people are getting really good at this, but I don't think Paintboard will get there. Um, and I would ask that even if we up it from 78% to 88 or 95, 
would you put that in a game? Maybe, maybe it's great. Yeah, maybe because it's fast, you make it in five minutes and you're out. If it was still that fast, yeah, I think it would be good. Um, I don't think it's very technically infeasible. Like I mentioned, you export these um, machine learning kind of trained machine learning algorithms and you just load them up. But I think the algorithm would need a lot of work before you do that. Or at least we need a better failsafe for situations like where the goals don't show up. We need to curve away some of the sharp edges of people before this goes live. And if you're interested in that, of course, the code will be out there. I'm happy to collaborate. Um, but those are my thoughts on exporting into a game. And have you thought about expanding this with your PhD research? Cool question. Yeah, so um, for those, I don't think I mentioned at the start, I'm going to start a PhD shortly in the fall. I'm going to keep this in the back of my head. Let's put it that way. Um, in terms of like four to five years of where to go with this, that's a really good question. So I guess the, sh the flippant answer to your question is no, I haven't really thought about it. But if I had to go for where to improve it, I think a lot of my future directions are really coo uh, cool. One of the things I'm really interested in is the multiple MPC training. I think that would be a really huge problem and really important, right? Because not just NPCs don't just interact with players. If you've played Assassin's Creed and all these open world games, NPCs interact with NPCs in these more complicated interactions. So you really need to tackle that problem of how to deal with, how to author behaviors, like paint the behaviors with multiple NPCs on the field. Um, you know, maybe you could do it one versus one for everything and be like, if this is an NPC versus a player, this is how they interact. Maybe it would work. And then you just throw them all and kind of weight the behaviors hand wavy, like you say, oh, this character should prefer to guard than run away, you know, or something else. Um, maybe that's a way to combine it, but maybe that won't work. Um, that was just my idea I had floating around earlier in my master's. You could have, um, maybe you train them specifically two, like, three-person combinations, four-person combinations, but now we need a lot of data, a lot of training, and why don't you just program it at that point? But I would think that is kind of the real key to tackle it. Like, if you want to make the next Skyrim with Paintboard, then uh, you really need to deal with multiple NPCs on screen. Cooperative, like friendly, foe, um, bakers, dragons, all this stuff. It's, um, that would be where I think I'd have to spend the most amount of my time. So, was this like an old. Any other question? Like, long Alright, let's thank our speaker again. Thanks, guys.